Welcome to a brand new episode of The Road Less Taken, our weekly web series where we interview people who've made unconventional career choices and excelled at them. My name is Venkyu Srinivasan, your host. My guest today on TRLT is someone whom I've admired for a very long time. He's blazed a trail in India in the world of sports broadcasting, programming, sports commentary and sports management. From 2008 to 2014, he was part of the Kolkata Knight Riders management team. He was the team director of the team. He then went on to become the project director for the FIFA Under-17 World Cup, the first global FIFA event held in India. And these days, he's a commentator on Crick Buzz and plays his role as CEO of the Pro Volleyball League, uh, a new initiative to promote the sport of volleyball in India. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Joy Bhattacharya as our guest for this episode of TRLT. Hi, Joy. And a pleasure and privilege to have you on this episode of The Road Less Taken. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, no, absolutely. It's my pleasure. I would love to be here. And as I said, you had me from the very moment you told me what the title of the series was. I was hooked. So, pleasure being here. Thank you so much. You know, your life has been defined by sport, if I might say so, to a very large degree, at least I think over the last maybe a uh, couple of decades or so. Uh, but tell us, uh, when you were growing up, uh, did you did you play sport yourself? And when did this whole opportunity of a career in sport come about for you and when did you contemplate it seriously that this was going to be a, a path that you were going to take? I was born and brought up in Delhi and then when I was about 9 or 10 years old I was moved, I father shifted back to Calcutta and he was transferred, he was in the army and I was just absolutely hated, hated, hated being a part of uh, Calcutta because the okay. school was in a small place. It was, you know, in a place where there was no natural light. I've come from Delhi Army Public School, you know, right. huge grounds of Buddha Jayanti Park beside you. And it was really small. And the kids who I was in class five, I had got a double promotion because there was no place in class four. Wow. It was younger than all the kids. And what happened was that whoever played in fourth, played in five, played in fifth, played in sixth. And I mean, the irony of it all was that in class seven or was it eight, they organized a game a football match for all the kids who never got a chance to play the game. Okay. okay. And I was 12th man in that. I didn't go onto the field. <laughs> Even in the end, the teacher said that, look, nobody's watching. You just get on the other 12th person. But I was so ashamed of myself. I never went there. What happened though was, you know, in the locality, I used to keep playing, used to play cricket, football, whatever it was. And when I went in the 11th, I shifted to Central School Fort William and they had a basketball court. Uh -huh. And that sort of caught me on fire. So I started playing basketball pretty seriously. I was using the table tennis as well. So I played basketball seriously throughout that. Oh, nice. Then when I went to university, I played you know, basketball for the university. I played cricket for my college. I played table tennis for my college. But I played basketball for the university for four years. I kept okay. the university. Did you, did you so, play cricket at the college level and come up against any of the... Uh, no names? No, the, no the, the, the only person I came up against once in the match against arts was a chap called Devanik Shingupta. Okay. And his claim to fame is very interesting. He played a couple of matches for Bengal, but okay. uh, he for a long time was the captain of the German cricket team. He worked with M. Dastur and uh, he went to uh, Germany to work with Dastur. And he oh. kept playing there and he became the captain of the German team. So I said, wow, yeah. I mean, very I got to know other international captains later, but uh, he was there much earlier. Wow, very nice. Coincidentally, the current captain of the German women's cricket team is a is a Kanadiga. Oh, uh, wonderful! Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, they're all from this part of the world, all South yeah. Asians. So it uh, after that, what happened was I came to you know I uh, quizzing was a large part of my life as it was to so many of us. So finished college. Uh, I was working as a software engineer. Always knew it wasn't my thing, so I you know shifted to joined. Derek O'Brien started work with him in big ideas, started doing interesting things. And then, as it so happened, I came to Delhi in 1994. And in 1995, I mean, these are the kind of coincidences that happened. The guy who was IMG TWI, who ran Indian cricket, football, hockey, was one floor above me. And I got friends with one of those guys. And they said that, you know what, we're trying to do a cricket quiz. Uh, we're, uh, you know, we're getting a, a statistician as one of the, as a question set. And I told him, look, it doesn't work. I mean, all of us know it doesn't work that way. So I said, so I said, give me 12, 10 minutes with your bosses. I need, they, they can't do a cricket quiz with the situation. So <laughs> he went up there and uh, I told them that. Of course, they didn't believe me. So they right. did two episodes and it was a disaster. So then they come back to me and they say that, you know what? Uh, 
so i went and i very happily i said them questions for four episodes and i know you know what to say i've done this yeah, before course, so yeah. I, i cracked it yeah and you know the standards not too high not too low these are cricketers after all right. it was a so called a question of cricket Uh-huh. So after I did four episodes, they said, "Fantastic! This is really good. We love it. We'll pay you five thousand rupees an episode." And that in those days, if you're doing four a week, right. was twenty thousand rupees. When my salary was about twenty-two thousand rupees, so it was a wow. huge chunk of money. It was almost right. my salary for writing four quizzes a month. Mm-hmm. And I said, "No, I'm sorry. I'm working with them. I can't take money." And mm-hmm. I remember at that time, everyone said, "You're out of your mind not to take this money." And I said, "I'm on for bigger fish." Mm-hmm. So after about three months' time. You see, it's a very interesting thing. If you don't pay someone, mm. even if they give you the questions, you're always insecure because you don't know whether they'll stay or they won't stay. Right. So they're right. like wondering whether this guy will stay or go because they have no leverage on me. They're not paying me money. I'm not accepting any money. Right. So after a while, this guy who later became a very good friend, Lawrence Chaffee, said, "You know what? Do you want to run this show?" So I came up and I met them, and I moved. I didn't even ask them for extra money. I moved an exactly the same salary to IMG to deploy. But the one thing they said was, you know, no Indian is a producer. They are all assistant producer, and I was already a producer in business related. So it was a stumbling block because they couldn't make mm-hmm. me a producer. I said, let me. I will join without designation, mm-hmm. and I will not join as assistant producer, whatever it was. Right. So whatever it was, it worked out, and from there I started working on Indian sport, and uh, that was the first because once I got there into just doing the cricket quiz, there are many. Lots of other time to spare, so I did football. I did the National Santosh Trophy, which was held in Jabalpur. Oh. Then started doing a few cricket magazine shows, nice. and then you know, 1997, the first National Football League, the Federation Cup, which is an amazing match. There's 140,000 people in Calcutta watching, listening on Morning Ram. So did all that, and that's where it started. And then after the stint with Siddharth Basu, I started freelancing again for ESPN Star Sports, mm. and then stayed with ESPN Star Sports for many years after that. Mm. how have you seen uh, that landscape of programming for television and now probably ott uh, whether it's uh, whether it's live sport or whether it's you know quiz shows knowledge based shows how have you seen that landscape change over the last couple of decades that you've been involved with it it's interesting because at one point there was nothing there at all so you know we literally invented it started doing right. stuff like the espn school quiz olympiad shows mm-hmm. like harsha and plug and harsha mm-hmm. online but all those things that we did those i mean i feel that still you know what we haven't got and we've got a bit of a culture around cricket mm. of people chatting talking around cricket you know cricket. but we really still don't have it for other teams we're not trying to replicate in a serious level mm. like in calcutta you had it for the uh, the you know isbing on monma and mohammedan sporting that right. kind of banter but that kind of thing you know and if you see espn espn never made its job as owning live sport Mm. they became big life sport guys much later okay they were guys for starters who would just talk about sport you know they ah. chat like billy packer they were crazy about college basketball nobody would watch it but they would talk about it right. and they were so espn was for sports enthusiasts far before it had the money to earn big rights mm. and it would do buy rights for college basketball games so nobody would watch at the time right. at, rather other than the final four right and that's why for a long time ESPN's biggest rated show used to be their preview show of the Super Bowl because okay. that's what it was, uh-huh. and I think that's the one culture. I think we've got a little bit in cricket now, and I think mm. with Quick Buzz coming, other people mm. doing stuff, I think we're getting a little bit of a culture of talking about the sport which is happening. Because what happens is that you know when you are Star Sports, and I've been Star Sports in ESPN, you have twenty twenty five minutes time at lunch. I mean, you need to take out five sponsored items. Right. You really can't chat. You can't. You can't afford to. You say, yeah. okay, so super fours are coming. That needs to be got out. Super sixes are coming. Correct. This uh, sponsored item is there. So the producer is not thinking about. Am I giving the guys entertainment? He is fulfilling sponsor commitment. Mm. Then that's the problem. That so you always look for a show outside which gives you that the ability to be able to chat and just have fun with the sport because find the sport is not rocket surgery. If it's not fun having people talk about cricket, why watch it? You know? mm. So that's what. So I think slowly it's developing. I hope it develops in other shows as well, in sports mm. as well. You know, I think football has huge subculture in this right. country. Right. And we need good ball, good football chat shows. I think they're terrible. Yeah. Right now. We really yeah. don't do it justice. I mean, at least I there's more coverage and people are watching stuff like kabaddi and uh, so on. Yeah. Now. So that's yeah. a start. Yeah. It is a start. It definitely yeah. is a start. 
but like the one thing you mentioned about things like for example college athletics college uh, basketball which is very big in in the us and in other countries in india there's practically not even like good print coverage about these things right i mean do you see that yeah you know all? yeah yeah it's terrible actually the only places where i've seen good print coverage of college sport and all to a certain extent is goa goes very good at this goa okay. really reports local football matches local cricket matches Nice. they do a lot of good local reporting which is i think is essential and see the other problem is print is no longer as powerful and useful as it used to be yeah yeah the print is, print print is coach, yeah kochi does a little bit of it but yeah most other cities at one time toi used to have a fairly decent coverage of stuff like the kanga league hmm. unfortunately that has now got pushed out what has happened is instead of having a lot of other small sports you have these three four big global sports right. like the nba right. f1 ipl and these really dominate tennis they dominate the headlines everywhere and it's sad because what happens is i find it really sad when a sports page say in delhi is exactly the same as a sports page in calcutta or mm. it shouldn't be like that right 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 okay i will uh, i will now fast forward a little bit and come to your uh, famous stint with the kolkata night riders when the ipl started so tell us how that came to be and tell us um, what was kolkata as a team how was this new dynamic of of putting a team together with global superstars each of whom is a superstar in his country or his national team all of them coming together having to play under uh, an indian captain an indian owned team how did that whole cultural dynamic play out and how did you all shape the culture of kkr as a team So at that particular point in time, I remember when this first auction was announced, and I had a look at it, and I realized that this is a bit like a game I designed for ESPN many years back, fantasy game called Super Selector. Right. So right. that it's Super Selector, but that two people can't choose the same guy. Right. So I myself went off to these guys, met these three four props in ISI, mm. and I said I want to make a model for buying in the auction where you oh, can wow. buy players. Okay. So we designed an auction model. So what we had to do is, what is the player ability? That data. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. If Ganguly or the coach would input, what we would output is, if given this, how can we get a team with the best ability, maximize the this thing? So we designed that software. So I I took it around to three four places, and uh, those days because I'm from ESPN, I know these guys. So I the Bombay guys were interesting. They said, you know what, we are prepared to buy the software and have a look at it. We may not use it, but that's us. We pay rights to just look at it and have it as. And keep it out of the market for others. Yeah, that's Bombay, and I understand if you have that kind of money and resources, it's quite understandable. Yeah. So then the two guys, the other two guys, were both interested. There was Bangalore, and that was interesting. Was Bangalore? I know those guys, and they're nice guys. And there was Calcutta. And the only thing was that I mean, I met Jeet, and Jeet said, "Look, we don't know. You don't know how long the journey is going to be with Bangalore. You're going to help in the auction definitely, and that may be that." Mm. Here you might have there may be something else to do. You're part of the city. You have a base there. Why did you lose? So we went and met Sharuk, and okay. we he was fine. He put us onto us. I think Lalit put us onto Sharuk. He wanted us to be a part of it. And after the auction finished, they just said that okay, you know, why don't you sort of would you be interested in staying on? And that's how it all happened. Nice. And it was just a series of things which never started off what it was. And I think it was crazy. And I think how little most of us knew at that time about what this. whole global thing is going to right. be how big it's going to be how mm. how ubiquitous it's going to be and also all the complications required i think at that point in time if you ask me honestly the only people who really knew their shit the others were actually flying off the field their pants was actually delhi and if okay. you look at the delhi team because t shaker was there and if you still look at the delhi team in those days they were fabulous team right I and mean, if you see the delhi team of say 2009 yeah that seva that gambhir They had Dilshan, they had Devilliers, yeah. they had David Warner, they had Dirk Nannis, they had Daniel Vettori, they had Shikhar Dhawan, they had Indian batsmen, they had everything needed. It's one of the most powerful teams ever to play and never win a championship. Right. But that's what I'm saying. That I think, oh, we really and we had the software and we tried to do the best we could. But mm. what we didn't realize is, say you're buying good foreign players. We had terrific foreign players, mm. but we could play only four. Mm. And that first year, most of them came for only. Four matches, they all went to be. Right. And our big problem was, I think, one of the things that happened was we also had bad luck. Gail got injured one day before coming up to India, uh, and that really changed it. If that first season we were six and seven, had Gail been there, perhaps the history of KKR would have been different. But on the other hand, 
I think it was really good for KKR that it went through those three terrible years for you know things to happen as they did mm-hmm. after that. It it must have been interesting, right? After that uh, kind of sluggish kind of start over the first four seasons, to three then seasons. kind of three seasons. three seasons, yeah. And but but then to come back and like really start putting your um, uh, uh, you know foot down there and becoming serious contenders and actually winning the title like multiple times, what what changed? Do you think? I think one is our backs were totally to the wall, so we had an opportunity of really looking what was important to us. And we did some very hard work. So one of the things we said is Indian batsmen are a necessity because uh-huh. batsmen have that great advantage of playing 20 overs. Mm. So if you see the KKR teams of 2008-9, we didn't have good Indian batsmen. We mm. had Shorov, but and he was not in the greatest form. T20 was not his sport. Right. So we had Shorov and we had Manoj Tiwari. But mm. we, what we said was we had really good Indian bowlers. We had Ishan, we had Agarkar, we had, you know, we had uh, Murli Kartik. They were good international bowlers. Mm. And we discovered that doesn't work. The reverse is better. If you have Indian batsmen, solid Indian batsmen, then they give you a base. So we went to that auction, the next auction, and we really went after. So we paid 5.6, 2.4 for uh, Gautam Gambhir, 2.1 for Yusuf Patan, and mm. 1.1 for Ahmed uh, Jacques Kalis. And mm. 5.6 out of 8 crores, we finished off in 30 minutes. People thought we were mad. But right. we had a very good idea of something. You know, If you understand a little bit of economics, what you realize is, there is a very, very low, very high flexibility in the prices of international batsmen. Mm. So, for example, in 2011, uh, Dave Harsi, who we wanted, went for $1.2 or $1.3 million. And say, an Owen Morgan went for $350,000. And okay? right. there's not very much to choose between these two players. Similarly, international fast bowlers leave out a Lasset Malinga, mm. but mm. from a Dirk Nanis to a Brett Lee, there is not much difference you'll get. They're all good, high-quality international fast bowlers. Right. But there's a huge price difference. So we said on these things where a difference in price does not give you too much difference in quality, mm. we'll just have a bottom figure saying, okay, these are seven fast bowlers. Whoever comes, we can buy it for 50000 we'll buy him now. And that's how we operated. So it was smart. It was a well-constructed team and it gave us results. That's what we Interesting. It's really good results. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Thank you for your Interesting. Uh, you know, to round off uh, this segment, I cannot let you go without asking you what your favorite Shah Rukh anecdote from those times is. <laughs> there are many Shah Rukh anecdotes. I think the Shah Rukh anecdote from the time is something I always talk about, which is that he was uh, the match with uh, the first day Shweb Akhtar was playing. It was the match against Delhi. Right. And there are 80,000 people at the Eden Gardens and Shweb Akhtar is bowling and KKR just made 147, 148. Not a great total. And Shoaib takes a wicket with the first over. He, I think he gets complete. And the crowd goes crazy. And Shah Rukh in those days, that was year one. You know, he was in the dressing room. Because those first year, there was nothing. You know, all these things were just... You were discovering it as a window. Mm-hmm. And he was obviously, he was having a uh, tag. And so he rushes out to see it. And the players see him. And I think Shoaib reckons to me, send him back. Because players are very superstitious. When you get a wicket, you don't change places. Right. So he goes back in again. And then Shoaib takes another wicket. I think this is Seva. And he charges out again. And he's like dancing. And the players are saying, go back in. Go back. And they send him in again. So he goes back into the dressing room. And then when Shoaib takes the third wicket, okay, he runs out again. He says, I don't give a fuck. I'm not going to go back this time. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And KKR wins the match. It's amazing. Wonderful. Great fun watching. We're just dancing out and then we send back again. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Seems to be have been like, and even now continues to come across as a man who really like, you know, supports his team and uh, will do anything for them. I, I want to talk about your next project, which was, um, you know, like history making for Indian sport, which is the first time uh, India hosted, has hosted a international FIFA event. Uh, and you were at the helm of affairs for that. Um, uh, I think there must be loads and loads of stories about you going up against the great Indian red tape, the steel frame to get things done. Tell us some interesting learnings from that entire process of putting a global event together. I think the two, three things was one was, you know what, you know, I've worked with people uh, with cricket and ESP and star sports, so they have production outfits. I mean, the two people who really know, and production means that you cover an event, you don't mm. organize an event. Mm. The two really global bodies who really know how to do events are IOA, the international, sorry, IOC mm. and uh, FIFA, because they have done it at a scale for that big of this thing. And I have to say FIFA is even bigger because I think in terms of viewership, maybe 
Right. They're roughly equal. I think FIFA is a bit ahead. Mm. But FIFA also does it in six, seven six stadiums yeah. around the country. Yeah. Or right. maybe two, three countries. Mm. Whereas, you know, once you do the Olympics, it's one yeah, city. Yeah, it's in one, one city. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the attention to detail that FIFA had, I mean, mm. and understanding how a global organization works and what is important for them is crazy. So, for example, there's this thing about ball boys. You know, the ball boys are the kids in shorts, girls are mm. guys who stand mm. outside, ball comes out, it's worth it. Mm. There's a 55 page, no, not 55, 85 page manual for ball boys and ball girls. Wow. What dress they wear, where they'll stand, where they're supposed to be sitting, what kind of training they have, what age they have. Inside the cooler that they are staying in, how many soft drinks, they're not soft drinks, how many juices should be there, how much water should be there. That kind of detailing. So if the temperature is above 35, the number of water is so much per kid has to be there. So that kind of, they've just done this so often. So seeing that was phenomenal understanding how a global body took an event out. And I'll tell you one more anecdote, which I don't think I've ever told before, is that two days before the finals, you know, we had this uh, two screens on either side of the Eden Garden. Mm. So there was a screen this side and a screen in the middle. And they were okay, but they were small. Because Eden Garden, uh, sorry, not the Eden Garden, you were at the ground. It's like a huge ground. ground. It's like a, it was meant to have 140,000, but we cut it down to about 69, 70,000 because FIFA has one more route. Every guy must be less than eight minutes away from a exit, safe place to the, okay. exit into the ground. Okay. So FIFA always evacuates into the ground. They say into the ground is the safest place. Never go outside into the ground. Mm. So from the furthest point out, everybody has to move, be able to move within eight minutes. So there were places which were empty because it failed that place. Ah, so okay. it's that huge ground. So we have this huge ground and we put up these two things. And basically everyone, the final by this time, the quarterfinal, same final happened. Like, the Calcutta is going crazy. Amazing yeah. games. Whole crowds are going crazy. Right. So they turned around and they said that, you know what, we want to build this thing. We'll build another one. Right next to it, we'll build another larger thing, which will be ready for the final. So I checked it. Everything is ready. We're having this big meeting and I go to the guy who's the head of FIFA, who's come down, the FIFA delegation. I said, you know, we're going to do this. He says, no. And I said, we'll do it. It's just two days and we'll be done. He said, no. Nothing changes because if one thing gets cut and that thing is not ready for the finals, whatever is there already is not ready for the finals. Finals won't happen. Wow. So they are so clear about it that even a 1% chance that you know this could disturb that particular mm. thing and this may stop working, they will not take a chance. They said, it's okay. Fine. It stays at this. The other was, you know, uh, in uh, Guwahati, the match was called off because of rain and the ground conditions. When within 40 hours, we had to move a match to Calcutta. And I'm thinking, how do you do it? Because the big problem is tickets you buy online, but they are redeemed straight. Mm. And because of Indian tax laws, you have to show, so you have to have the tickets printed and pick up the tickets. Now, how do you get printed tickets across? So first, when we opened it up for sale, we knew that, you know, there's going to be enough people because the same time, this is like a bonus for Calcutta. Correct. But how do you actually now ensure the queue was one lakh people? One lakh people were in the queue to buy tickets. That was a bizarre. At least one lakh sixty thousand. I remember that day. Wow. And then what happened was that uh, how do you actually do it? So what we did was we said all tickets are one hundred rupees. It's the lowest cost. All tickets are hundred rupees. But what's going to happen is when you come to pick up your ticket at the redeeming center. They're not going to print a specific ticket. They will pick up the first four tickets with them. Just give it to you. So you could get a 600 rupees seat. You could get an 800 rupees seat. You could get a 100 rupees seat. But if you're paying 100 rupees, you will get at least that or better. Oh, because but... we priced them all at 100. Wow. And then they came. And still, there was a the day of that, there was a huge fight because all these, uh, these things that come, all these you know, black marketers have come and they've held the counters and they said, we won't move. You, know, you have to give us tickets or they won't move. So anyway, we called the police, all this happening. The guy is standing on top of us, uh, standing on top of the ticket booth, trying to figure out what's happening. <laughs> so somehow we managed that. And then after that, people start taking tickets. Calcutta crowd, they know their uh, stadium like this thing. So they moan, they see, they know this tic- these tickets are in a n- not in a nice place. So their friends are saying, wait, let this ticket get over. Moment G-block tickets start, now goes to the standing line. So they're like <laughs> calculating what... 
what stocks we have down there and the moment one particular set comes up great so it was quite something but we when i i remember that day standing in the ground at 5:30 and the game was 8 o'clock and you know there were thousands of people hundred people thousand people and they coming in one day they make it will there be enough people and five minutes before the whistle it was that chop and it was absolutely amazing. and and that's the re- and that's what makes it so fulfilling right to to see that the fans respond with such passion and uh, with such interest uh, yeah. for for an event and that was the one thing that fifa was really impressed by mm. i mean that's what organizations like fifa and uh, uh, ioc don't do that well which is to be able to be nimble about these things and mm. for us, the way we moved it fifa actually suggested to us we played behind closed doors because they said you know how can you give tickets in this much time it said we much we do something very nice very nice Uh, and then over the last few years you've been involved in this um, in the initiative uh, with uh, volleyball with the new uh, league uh, coming through uh, how has that been do you see volleyball as an exciting sport for india uh, do you see potential and oh yeah it's a look it's an amazing sport we did a first season we had some terrific team we did a terrific season and it was so good that the international volleyball people fivb without our invitation came down because look for every international league that's understand one thing every international sport wants to be in india because mm. it's the next big market and unlike china it's not a very regulated market you can get things done in india mm. in china mm. it's very difficult to do things because the government is very tough so this is the next big market so they came here and they we were supposed to do a second version of the league but uh, the federation by itself yeah. is in court they cancel our contract then they fought with each other apparently there are two federations two bodies yeah. so as i said the bane of indian sport of the federation Mm. Volleyball was hugely successful. We had Olympic players here. It was terrific. The quality of volleyball was great. It was watched around India, and we got great numbers. So I'm just hoping at some point sense will prevail because wherever the free market prevails, mm. I mean Indian sport, the bane of Indian sport is the kind of federations we have and the kind of people running it. It's just a, it's an absolute shocker, and something has to be done. yeah and 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 yeah hopefully those things will change once yeah they see that um, some other success stories have happened so no you see already it's happening like kabaddi hmm. kabaddi federation now has changed three times over the players no longer care because they say this is the sport this is what will get us recognition this is how these mashal sports are running it yeah now the federation changed they they took away the rights from star they gave it to somebody else and it didn't matter because star just went on they said we're doing an auction all the players came there so yeah. that's exactly what needs to be let the free market let players understand and i'm telling you that if we do it today if we do it the problem will be getting corporate sponsors to buy franchises to buy teams because mm. what they don't have is faith in these the federation that tomorrow they want somebody won't get greedy and blow it up again <laughs> that's the big problem the problem yeah. is not about players the problem is not about quality of players. yeah 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 okay so um you know as we come uh, towards the end of uh, this wonderful chat uh, you know a, a few quick questions to you before we do a, a rapid fire quiz with you uh, one of them is yes, uh, <laughs> one of them is about what what would you uh, i think today uh, uh, i've been speaking to a lot of people and there's a lot of interest among uh, younger people uh, uh, to look at a potential career in sport in 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 some aspect of sport whether it's broadcasting whether it's uh, event organizing athlete management data analytics what have you uh, where do you look at that and what kind of advice what advice would you give uh, aspiring sports professionals see the problem is that right now it's still a very very the problem uh, the market is not a very uh, organized market mm-hmm. so it's, it there's a lot of potential but you know getting that first break is so much hit and miss it's still not funny like it's not a proper system that you get into the iims you get in here then you get this way to do and that is one of the problems so a lot of it is about opportunity i tell people even if you don't get can't get into sport directly try and get into sport sponsorship or try and get into things that are around sport mm. because this field will grow it will grow bigger and bigger but it's just a matter of first sort of sorting this out and making sure that you get the right opportunities and that is something that So the path now in their company, there's a company that's recently started called Sport Joe, which are who are trying to sort of try and bridge that gap between people who want to come in, good people who want to come in, and employees looking for good people. Excellent. But you know they need to be more and more guys like that, and they really need to make a difference. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Uh, next question, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot over here. The 2020 IPL has is coming towards its end stages. Um, 
when this episode goes on air i think we'll be on the last day or the penultimate day of the league matches uh, but uh, sitting here even today i think we have a fairly uh, decent idea what's uh, what's your call on ipl 2020 i uh, between i still think despite all the hiccups between bombay and delhi okay I, and i think uh, i think if i have to put one against the other i think i think mumbai would jag it just because Uh, I think a lot of their players know what it is like to be in mm. championship winning situations, and therefore just have that experience. If they reach that far, mm. they'll probably jag it. Interesting. So Mumbai DC final with Mumbai defending their title is what Joy is going for. Excellent. Uh, and as a last question, Joy, I mean you have a fabulous bookshelf behind you, and I know that you are a voracious reader. Uh, can you recommend uh, for our viewers uh, maybe two or three must-read books? Okay. Okay, uh, I'll go with this. Uh, this is a book called uh, "It Changed My Life." It's a book called "Godel Elsh or Bach: The Golden Braid" by Douglas Hofstadter, and it's mm-hmm. like this book about this connection between Godel, who wrote about the incompleteness theorem, and it's about it's about recursion. It's about things that it's about Escher. You know how his drawings are recursive, and I remember, you know, I was what I was uh, maybe a sixteen, seventeen, no, seventeen and a half, eighteen, and I was. It was in the Doon School Library. My brother-in-law used to teach okay. there, and okay. I saw this and I started reading this, and it is—it just blew my mind at that stage. That you know how numbers work, how paradoxes mm. work, how recursion mm. works. How it was just this is a book that changed my life, and you know forever gave me some interest in maths, you know math science. Interest. I mean, it was a book that was huge. So that's one I definitely go for. The second is a very interesting series. It's called. This is called. This will make you smarter. So don't go. This is not really a self-help book. I wish it were. <laughs> so this is. Uh, there's a chap called John Brockman who runs a magazine called Edge. Okay. And every year, what he does is he gets all these guys to write about one question. Okay. Is being put. So this this year's question was: This will give me a write about one thing that will make somebody smarter. Okay. And it's so it's people like. Richard Dawkins, Stephen mm-hmm. Pinker, Daniel Kahneman, Sam Harris, Matt Ridley, the greatest minds of our period just write about one thing which they thought if people knew would make them smarter. Interesting. And they're all just small essays. They're like the longest is about four or five pages. Okay. But it's just purely distilled three pages, just a concept trying to tell you what a concept is. And so in this series, my favorite actually, I couldn't find the book right now, is that you know. uh there is elegant theories it's about elegant theory so what uh, what is all these guys what is their most favorite most elegant theory you know people have talked about evolution all but the way they look at it and you know to be able to write beautiful science in three four pages yeah. and make yeah. it understandable to somebody who doesn't know that science it's just amazing so right. i mean these i strongly 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 recommend i mean it's some of the things i know and because one, a lot of other guys one, will and one sports book ah sports book okay sports book read this if you haven't read it it's actually a terrific book it's a book called nation at play it's a history of sport in india yeah and it's written by rajesh and amazing because you know what it gives you and i think one of the things that people don't understand people ask this question all the time to me that you know why is indian sport so screwed up you know and once you understand the real story that you know the brits why did the brits bring it to india how did it develop with the brits what who did they hand over they handed over to maharajas because mm. who else had the time <laughs> in 47 when people are thinking roti kapda makan only Correct. the maharajas have time to hang around and they in turn handed it over to the bureaucrats and the politicians and how it was misused in their hands so this book will give you a sense of it's written by the chef called ranajay sen who yeah. is now teaching in singapore but yeah. it will give you a real real sense because without understanding indian sport you can't change it and i hope some of you guys are going to go and change it one day great thank you thank you so very much uh, wonderful thoughts always a pleasure talking to you uh, i'm not going to let you go without uh, you're a quiz master but i know that you are an avid quizzer as well uh, so here is me donning the quiz master hat for a rapid fire five question quiz for you uh, all based on the kolkata night riders so are you ready Yeah, I hope you have some before 2014 because after that, my yes, memory yes. will cease. Most of most of it, in fact, almost all of it is from the time you were there. Perfect. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Question number one: In the very first ever IPL match between KKR and RCB, who played one down for KKR? 
so it was shorter and uh, mccallum opened the innings uh one down was ricky ponting i think that is correct that is correct uh this player made his debut for kkr against uh, another team in 2011 recorded his two highest scores in the ipl against the same team and also played his last ipl match against the same team in 2015 who Oh, and the other team i can tell you was uh, csk ah i think i know which it is it is jackal uh not jackal no 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 jackal also made his debut with csk no 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 jackal played csk was the first match of 2011 so it has to be a player who made so no rajat bhatia didn't come back in 2015 he made one very significant innings against csk ah okay bisla Manvinder Bisla. Manvinder Bisla, ah, right? Of course, of course, yeah. of course. Bisla, two thousand fifteen. Ah, he he made two. Actually, he made two big knocks in two thousand eleven. He got a big one against uh, CSK. Then two thousand thirteen, he again in CSK he got a big yeah, one. Yeah, one eighty nine, one ninety two. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Who hit the winning runs for KKR in the two thousand twelve final? Manush Tiwari. Correct. Of of Ben Ruin Bravo's bowling. Yeah. That is correct. Uh, who so far has scored the only century in an IPL final in a losing cause? Yeah, Riddhi Mansa against us in uh, 2014. Yes, yes, a local boy, but scored uh, against you. But it was wonderful. And played for KKR also three seasons. Yeah, I mean, yeah amazing, yeah. amazing guy. Yeah, and will hopefully be on the India to Australia. Sure, well, yeah, yeah. Touch wood. By by this time, it should be decided. So I hope yeah. he's on the flight. Yeah, yeah. And last question: Who won the orange cap in 2014 when KKR won the title? Robin Utter. That is correct. As expected, Joy has maxed the quiz. So thank <laughs> well, you, thank you, Joy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your insights. Always a pleasure talking to you. And uh, you know, hope to be in touch. Hope to uh, keep hearing from you on all with all your wonderful stories uh, and anecdotes. And uh, uh, viewers, you can follow Joy on all his social handles. He's uh, very prolific. Puts out. wonderful stories anecdotes insights all of that please uh, uh, please do follow him uh, thank you very much joy thanks venki it's been wonderful being here it's been a truly wonderful experience thank you so much and have fun thank you so much thank you sakesh i hope you heard and enjoyed the wonderful stories anecdotes and lessons that we he- just heard from joy bhattacharya about his career in the world of sport in india he holds out a lot of hope and positivity that this can indeed become a career option for young professionals going forward as the sport begins as the world of sport in fact begins to expand in india and becomes much more professional if that inspired you and you enjoyed the conversation please don't forget to tune in to future episodes of the road less taken they drop on our youtube channel nexus consulting at periodic intervals we have highlights as well as full episodes of all past interviews on the channel please like share and subscribe till we meet you again in another episode of trlt stay home stay safe and bye bye